Okay. Now, we'll uh, continue today with our cases uh, of uh, neoplasia with images. And now, our first case is from an old uh, middle-aged man who has a long history of ulcerative colitis. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's the environmental effect. As time passes, you look like Greek students. That's not so good. Greek students. The lesson starts. Oh, it's not necessary to pay attention. Sometime I'll, I'll grasp a word or something. Why? Why so? It's not your fault. No, it's ours. But not all of us are responsible for this situation. Not all of, of us. The majority, maybe. But not all. So, there was a long history of an inflammatory disease of the bowel. Tissues who have, uh, which have uh, chronic inflammation. What happens to the cells if there is a chronic inflammation? What uh, effect does this inflammation have on the cells if there is chronic inflammation? Yes. If there is acute inflammation, it is a most uh, probable conclusion that there will be necrosis. And we saw liquefactive necrosis in bacterial uh, inflammation, yes. But when we have an autoimmune inflammation and there is a persistent stimulus, inflammatory stimulus, on epithelial cells, this makes them proliferate. This is a trigger of proliferation in these cells. So, if we have a cellular population which has a constant stimulus for proliferation, what may happen to these cells? If they go on proliferating at an increased rate, because epithelial cells of the bowel normally proliferate because they regenerate, the mucosa regenerates. But if we have a persistent stimulus for increased proliferation, what may happen to the epithelial cells of the colon? They may have mutations. And these mutations may give an advantage to some cells to proliferate more than other cells and thus become neoplastic cells. And when cells become neoplastic, there is a possibility that sometime they'll start invading the lamina propria or the bowel wall, and this is cancer. So, in such a patient, we see that he has increasing fatigue and right upper quadrant dis discomfort, some discomfort here. So, have a look at the CT scan. What's the problem here? Which organ is affected and causes these symptoms to the patient? What do you think? Which organ is affected here? Yes, please. The liver. The liver. And what can you see in the CT scan? It looks very long. <laughs> yes? That crosses the entire abdomen, I'd say. And then there are these darker patches. There are three, uh, three lesions, all right? Uh, are they... How can you de define them as lesions? Because they, they give a different signal than the rest, than the rest of the liver. So, if it is cancer, and we have three foci of cancer in conjunction with the long-standing ulcerative colitis history of the colon, how can this be justified? Yes, please. Metastatic. And when we have a neoplastic, a malignant population that needs blood to grow, such a foci can become necrotic. That's why in the previous image we had on our last lesson, we had this, you see, this foci, this multiple metastatic foci have an umbilication. That means because they become necrotic. 
malignant cells can become necrotic. So, apart from the CT findings, in the biochemical test of the patient, which enzyme is to become increased? Which enzyme? And to be precise, which hepatic isoenzyme is increased of this enzyme? Yes. Alkaline phosphatase, because this enzyme, when combined with liver pathology, describes that, it, that there is some sort of obstruction in the bile circulation. And such can happen if there is a stone in some place, but also if there is a tumor Professor, in some place. Yes? What about the glutamic transferase of the liver? Yes, this is an enzyme which the liver cells use to make, to function. Mm -hmm. It does not have to do with the circulation of bile through the liver sinusoids to the bile duct from the... Why, why is one a better indication of cancer than the other? Or of it is not specific for, for cancer. Yes. It is just suggestive because it means when alkaline phosphatase is increased, there is an obstruction in bile circulation. It could be cancer, it could be a benign tumor, it could be a, a stone. But in conjunction with this image and the long-standing history of a predisposing factor to cancer development, this most probably means that this metastatic disease. The other, the other markers, for example, you see bilirubin, it's not increased. Why? Because the obstruction in bile circulation is focal. There is not a problem in the bile duct, the common bile duct. So from the other parts of the liver, bile circulates. So we do not expect that bilirubin is increased. And transaminase levels are not significantly increased because this is a marker of liver cell destruction, transaminase levels. That happens in hepatitis. And in some forms of acute hepatitis, transaminase levels are very, very high, more than 1,000. So this is the biochemical profile of this patient. Now, here we have a lymph node. It's an old man with a four-month history of unexplained weight loss and dyspnea. His workup reveals deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So something happened in his blood and it forms clots. All right? And so one clot, clot left the part, the, the, the place where it was formed and went to the right heart, left the right ventricle and made embolism in the pulmonary artery. All right? That's the patient. A firm and painless left supracavitular node, known as Virchow node, was biopsied. So, apart from this pulmonary embolism, we touch here and we find a lump. And this is a lymph node. When lymph nodes increase, the size of lymph nodes increases, this is lymphadenopathy. And the usual cause of lymphadenopathy, as you'll see in the next lessons, is not cancer. It is probably some sort of inflammation. However, since malignant tumors give metastasis both through lymph vessels and blood vessels, when we have an enlarged lymph node, we suspect that this could be cancer, either primary, meaning a lymphoma from the lymph node tissue, or metastatic. And this is an area here where, from anatomy, the major thoracic, thoracic duct comes to join the superior vena cava. And this blood which comes from this node and passes from this node has the right size of the head and 
the organs of the digestive system, the stomach, the bowel, mainly the stomach. So, have a look now at the lymph node on the microscope. Can you tell me which is normal and which is not normal? What do you expect as normal in a lymph node and what is not normal? Who can show me? Yes, please. So there are some circular structures, tubular structures, yes. And which is the lymph node Parenheim? Which is the lymph node Parenheim? This is the abnormal. The tubular structures are a foreign tissue. Yes. We shouldn't find that in the lymph node. Which is the normal lymph node Parenheim? That one, yes. Why? Because these are lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes stain dark blue, because they do not have much cytoplasm, so they are blue. Now, this is a foreign tissue forming tubules, tubular structures. So, what is the cause of lymphadenopathy in this patient? Can you find the differentiation of the foreign tissue? Is the foreign tissue adequ adequately differentiated to think where it could come from and enter the Virchow's node. What do you say on this? Who can tell me? We see tubular structures. If we see tubules, which form of tissue in histology forms tu tubules that you've studied in histology? Which tissue forms tubules? Yes, please. The? The blood vessels have a lumen, but the lining is endothelium. Endothelial. These are tubules with well-formed lining. Not endothelial cells, but which cells are they that form tubules? Which cells form tubules and the tissue, the respective tissue? Mm, yes? Glandular epithelium. So, since we have a foreign tissue of glandular epithelial origin in the lymph node, we must think, which organs have such epithelium? Because probably a cancer has arisen in these organs and through the lymph circulation gave metastasis to this node. That's why we find tubules, foreign structures in this node. So, which organs have tubular epithelium? Tell me, please. Please, you. Want to tell me? Tell me where, where, where there is epithelium. That's no, no problem if you don't know. The problem is not when you don't know. The problem is when you do not want to know. That's the problem. If you don't know, it's no problem. That's why I'm here. What is the problem? The problem is if you do not want to know, because if you do not want to know, I can do nothing. So, can you tell me what sort of epithelial, do you know? What sort of epithelial tissue? What sort of epithelial are there in histology? I, I can help you, there's no problem, no problem. And there's no problem if you do not know something. I insist on this. So, for example, if I open my mouth, see here? What is this? The mucosa. Yeah, you mean like squamous That's right. One form is squamous. Is this squamous? No. This is glandular. So it cannot come from a cancer of the oral cavity, at least from the covering epithelium, because the covering epithelium is squamous. We cannot have squam we do not have squamous differentiation here. So it cannot come from the covering epithelium. The esophagus? No, because the esophagus. The lining is also squamous. Other organs, where the epithelium is not squamous, the mucosal epithelium, but where the mucosal epithelium is glandular. Can you tell me other organs with glandular epithelium? Yes, please. The lung, yes, because the bronchi have glandular epithelium. So it could be 
a, a lung cancer. It's a possibility. Other organs, stomach, colon, breast in women. So all these organs could be, re if a cancer has grown in these organs, they could give this metastasis because this is an metastatic adenocarcinoma. Why? Because I see that it forms glands. So it is from glandular epithelium. And of course, this predisposes that the structures have lumen. So it is adequately differentiated so as to understand where it may come from. So, the present metastatic tissue is and has made this and has produced this procoagulant substance and this caused which uh, which lesion in the patient all this that the malignant cells have produced made the patient's blood to form what? Clots. Clots. That's why he had the pulmonary embolism. So this is a symptom and a finding that is not directly correlated with the growth of the tumor, but it is a systemic, a systemic disease related to the tumor. And how is this called? And this is how many malignant neoplasms become diagnosed because they produce some factors, they enter the blood, and in the present case, they formed clots. What is this, uh, this syndrome called? How is it called? The paraneoplastic syndrome. Yes. So, if we have an adenocarcinome, have a look where we have to look if there is cancer to find the primary site of cancer. These are the most common sites of adenocarcinomas in men, and these are the most common sites of adenocarcinoma in women. Now, let's have a look here. Yes, please. Can you please explain what is paraneoplastic syndrome? What is a paraneoplastic syndrome? It is a systemic, systematic, systemic syndrome caused by substances produced by malignant cells. It does not have to do with the, total, the, the local growth of the tumor, but from what the tumor produces and enters the blood. Most such substances, we'll see another one shortly, uh, act as hormones. They have endocrine effects. So, if you have a patient with a hormone imbalance, check if there is cancer some, someplace. And the hormone is secreted not from the normal gland, which is supposed to secrete the hormone, but there is ectopic. From an, a wrong side, cancer in this case. Now, have a look here. Yes, but I, I'm very glad you make questions, but since I was obliged to have a three-quarter lesson and not a one-hour lesson as I intended, because we have to start at a quarter past 12 and finish at one o'clock. Of course, I would finish at one o'clock. You know that. I never go beyond time. But now I do not have much time for questions, but Anyway, after the lesson. Now here, there is an image from a patient who has a persistent and intractable abdominal pain. Which histologic structure is surrounded by cancer cells as part of their invasion? And consequently, there is a pain, not an acute pain, a rather soft pain. So, can you define the structures and show me where the normal tissue is and where are the malignant cells surrounding the normal tissue? Who can show me? Hmm? How do malignant cells look like? Since, as a rule, 
they have nuclear pleomorphism and the nuclei are big, different in shape from one cell to the other. So, malignant tissue stains dark. Why? Because the nucleus is big. So, we have hematoxylin staining, not eosin. This is a rule with exceptions, of course, but here, all you see da as dark staining cells are cancerous cells. So, who can show me? Show me, please, where the cancerous cells are. Here they are. And these structures which are surrounded by them are because the patient had a pain, a rather soft pain, not an acute pain, a soft pain. So, what are these structures which are surrounded by malignant cells and cause pain to the patients? Which structures are they? Nerves. nerves. They are peripheral nerves, which are entrapped, entrapped in cancerous tissue. Yes, this is cancerous tissue. And this is the nerve. That's right. Okay? So, and what else can we say here? Perineural invasion, yes. And when we see in some cancers, oh no, as time passes, you just come to look like Greek students. I am disappointed. As time passes, everybody turns Greek here. Why? It's not necessary. Not necessary. We have an English course now. The Greek course is another matter. Here we are in an English course. All right? So, what did I tell you? Uh, when malignant cells infiltrate such spaces, there is a possibility that metastasis develop. Why? Because around these nerves, which structures are there so that the malignant cells who make the perineural invasion enter these structures and give metastasis? Which structures might this be? Yes? Lymph vessels. Vessels, that's right. Lymph vessels. So we have lymph node metastasis, such as the one we saw previously, or Blood vessels, so we have hematogenous spread. What is hematogenous spread? It's distant organ metastasis. That means end-stage disease. End-stage disease. And what else do we learn from this image? Why are tumor cells immortal and they keep on growing? Why? Because they have a capacity to proliferate in the absence of physiologic growth signals, if cells proliferate but are dependent on physiologic growth signals, what is this lesion called? Cells proliferate, but they are under control of physiologic growth signals, meaning that when the, the signals are, not, are no longer present, the cells do not keep on proliferating. How is this called? Yes, yes. That's hyperplasia, that's right. But in neoplasia, they keep on growing. Excellent. And to frustrate normal apoptotic pathways. And often, malignant cell reactivate telomerase. So they acquire virtually unlimited replicative capacity. Now, how do these cells look like? Do they look benign or malignant? And why? What are the signs of malignancy you can identify in this cell population? What are the signs of malignancy? Tell me, please, why do these cells look malignant? Uh, Sarah, can you tell me? Hmm? Why do they look malignant? Get the, this, this image now. For example, what does this one do here? You see this one? What's the nucleus like in that center cell? You see it has split into two. What's this? If, if the cell splits, if the nucleus splits into pieces, what is this called? Hmm? 
it could be, no, it could be a lymphocyte, it could be any cell. If we have the nucleus of a cell and it splits in two, what is this? No problem. Can you tell me? If a cell splits in two, what's happening to the cell? You see this, this nucleus, it has split in two, two parts. Meiosis. In? Meiosis. Mitosis. Mitosis. Meiosis in, in germ cells. So it's mitotic activity. Have you all identified the cell which is in mitosis? Eh? Did you all find the cell which is in this situation? This is it. Here. Now, have a look at this nucleus. Have a look at this nucleus. Have a look at this nucleus. How can you describe these neoplastic nuclei? What do you think? Are they similar in size? No. This is nuclear pleomorphism. They do not look like each other. Others are with coarse distribution of chromatin in the nuclei. Such as, have a look at this one. Have a look at this one. Have, look at, the, at this. Do you see the chromatin, how it is distributed here? Coarse, coarse, not fine, coarse distribution. And this is hyperchromasia, hyperchromasia, this nucleus here. So, if these cells are not in their proper site and they come to other tissues, they invade. They invade. They are pleomorphic, they are malignant. What do we do next? We try to find the differentiation. Firstly, firstly, to make the diagnosis, the histogenesis of the tumor. Because most probably, the tumor to which a neoplastic population differentiates is the same tissue from which it arises. For example, if this is an adenocarcinoma, it arises from glandular epithelium. However, there is one characteristic in the cytoplasm of these cells which helps us postulate where it comes from. In the cells who have an adequate amount of cytoplasm, what color is it? So, leave the nuclei now. We look at the cytoplasm. What color is the cytoplasm in these cells where you can see? Yes, please, pink. So, can you identify, can you remember cells which have enough cytoplasm and it looks pink? In which epithelial tissue are these cells a component of the tissue? For example, in a glandular epithelium, cells do not appear pink because they probably secrete mucin, so they have some droplets of mucin. It's not likely so to be a glandular tissue. It's not an adenocarcinoma. Other cells which acquire pink cytoplasm as they grow, and finally they become apoptotic, and we see that they are too dark, too darkly pink, and they have some follicular configuration when they are terminally differentiated. Do you remember these cells? Which tissue has these cells? They, yes, please? The keratinocytes, excellent. Squamous epithelium. So this is a morphologic sign that make us postulate that this is a squamous cell carcinoma. If we saw keratinization, we would be more sure. However, at least in this site, the tumor is not enough differentiated so as to see keratinization and understand that it comes from squamous epithelium. The only sign of squamous differentiation is the pink cytoplasm. So we need an additional information to be sure that this is a squamous cell carcinoma. And how can this be provided? How can this be provided? All right, we have some morphologic signs of squamous differentiation. How can we verify that this is squamous epithelium? 
Is there a method we use in pathology to define the... Where do these cells come from? Where do they derive? Which is this method? It's not a routine stain, such as hematoxylin eosin. It's a specific stain. Yes? That has to do with the invasiveness, how they invade. To define the nature of the cells, which markers are available and in which technique. It's not a, huge, a, a, a routine stain. Which? I think we said that in our first lesson. Hmm? Yes, please? Is stain? This is for connective tissue. Oh, Mason is a histochemical stain. These are histochemical stains. This stain is not histochemical that I am asking for. This is? Yes. Have it on Google and it will show. Have it will show. Everybody. Google knows everything. You say, you write, define the nature of cells. Pathology technique. Write it. Write it. No, not, not in the tablet. In the phone. In the phone. You write, define nature. Have a look. The use of Google now. It will tell us. Write down, yes please. Define the nature of malignant cell. Pathology technique. What does it say? I'll check, but I will be very strict in my exam. What does it say? Tell me please. Um, Which? Large nucleus having an irregular size. This is morphology. All right, we saw large nuclei, we saw that. Yes, technique? No, no technique. For the nature, for histogenesis. What does it say? <laughs> what how does it say? <laughs> eh? Let me see. Oh, quite a lot, quite a lot. It's immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry. There are markers of squamous differentiation, immunomarkers. You have a special stain. And when these cells are stained, for example, for the marker P40, you understand that it is a squamous uh, cell carcinoma as you have postulated previously. So a technique to define the nature of malignant cells when morphology is not enough is immunohistochemistry. Now, the primary site here we have a squamous epithelium, it's most probably from the lower gen genital tract and from the cervix. And the stage is high because it has spread to adjacent organs such as the rectum and the bladder. You see here, you see the symptoms here? Pain on defecation and difficult urination. This is most probably related to the contiguous spread. Because as you know, and you've learned from the previous lessons, how do malignant neoplasms spread? Which are the three roots of cancer spread? Don't know that? Oh, I we'll have to give private lessons, yes. In Greek. It turned Greek. It turned Greek. The, the course turned Greek. Oh, no, the language is not enough, I'm afraid. The language is not enough. We have to change the mind. Change the mind. Language is not enough to do the job properly. <laughs> they spread either contiguously, the surrounding tissues, the surrounding organs, either from lymph vessels and either from blood vessels. Lymph node metastasis, distant organ metastasis. These are the three roots of cancer spread. Next. Contiguous. Local spread. But invasion, not just as a benign leoplasm pressing the tissues. The third is lymph node metastasis and hematogenous metastasis. Have a look at this neoplasm. It looks like normal adipose tissue. If you see the histology, what was it? A mosquito? A mosquito came? Yes. yes. Now it starts because it comes from Africa. 
like you see the sky have you seen the sky today yes. it's the sand from the desert it comes here where are you from Thank you. and you have the same problem you have the same problem with the sun it comes from the desert good now you have you take a section from the neoplasm what tissue is this from histology you know this tissue this is fat tissue so if I ask you what do you see here I see fat tissue however it's a neoplasm because you saw it macroscopically you saw it from the eye you put it on the microscope and it's fat tissue so it's fully fully differentiated what does full differentiation complete differentiation mean it means that it looks like a normal tissue however it's a neoplasm because you saw it macroscopically this is a lipoma a benign neoplasm with differentiation to mature tissue oh no the the carcinogenesis paths you know them better than me why because this is from theory so i have nothing to do in these slides i'm sure you know them better than me so you can ask me when i manage to study them myself so this is growth factors the cut APC cutting pathway, translocation, ah, and RAS. This one I know. Why? Because there is a clinical implication. If you have a large bowel, a colon cancer, and you look in the molecular department and RAS is mutated, that means that the pathway of EGFR does not function. So it is no use targeting this pathway with a medication. This is the clinical importance of rash mutated colon tumors. If rash is not mutated, you can target the pathway to destroy the cell. Good. Next. Uh, this is, can you understand in which organ this tumor, another mosquito came? Another one, oh, problem. So where can this tumor be? Have a look here. Can you identify the organs? I'll help you. Tell the mosquito to leave, not bite me. Because if it bites me, what will happen there? A giant cell granuloma, so from inflammation that. The mosquito, the giant cell granuloma, remember that? From inflammation? Good. So what is this, my dear? What is this? This organ? No problem if you don't know. I'll tell you. It's no problem. What is the problem? I'll say it again. If you do not want to know, if you do not want to, to learn, nothing can be done. You lose your time and, you, and your money in the, in the specific context here. So, what can this be? Help. You help. This one, the big one. Yes. The liver. That's right. So, if we use something that is colored this could be the stomach this could be the spleen and this is something above the kidney which organ is this above the kidney the adrenal gland you see the tumor here and it is probably malignant because it secreted hormones and this lady here had some signs of masculinization so how what is the syndrome that the tumor was diagnosed from what it secreted and entered the circulation and acted as hormone paraneoplastic yes you'll study then what can that be in the lung this lesion here this could be a tumor that's right what can this tumor produce? This tumor can produce ACTH. Where does ACTH act? On the adrenal cortex. And what does it produce? Cortisol. So, as a paraneoplastic syndrome, what can the patient develop? Cortisol is a hormone that helps diabetes. Insulin. Yes, insulin resistance. So, it can become diabetic the patient and since there are some receptors where 
glycocorticoids act as aldosterone, what symptom can bring to the patient? If cortisol secreted by the adrenal cortex helps the function of aldosterone, what symptom will the patient develop? Chronic, yes? Not, it's not the antidiuretic hormone, it's aldosterone, hypertension. So, in all these symptoms, a tumor was responsible, all right? So, always think of it. It's not always the case, of course, but sometimes it is. Here we have a benign tumor of neural differentiation. This is why it expresses S100 protein, which is an immunohistochemical marker of neural differentiation. Have a look at these two images. In which image is the staining more intense? In which image? In the upper one. So, which of the two, which of the two tumors is more differentiated? What do you think? Which of the two tumors is more differentiated? The, the one that is up. Why? Because it shows signs of neural differentiation more intensely than the, the one that is down. Both are of the same origin. However, the one wh which is more differentiated expresses the marker more intense, but intensely. You, you see, comparatively. Have a, have a look at the images. One is the stain in full area of the tumor, the other is it is positive, but not at such an extent. Next one. Another staining here. This is a lymphoid marker. We'll start lymphomas from the next lesson. So if we have malignant cells with no signs of differentiation, we have immunohistochemical markers of epithelial differentiation, such as cytokeratin, negative. Immunohistochemical markers of melanoma, negative. Immunohistochemical markers of sarcoma, that means a malignant neoplasm of mesenchymal origin, negative. And we have common leukocyte antigen, CD45. This is positive. So this is a malignant cell, a malignant cell population deriving from lymphocytes from blood cells. If it is a tumor in a special site, it's a lymphoma. If these cells circulate in the blood, it's a leukemia. All right? And if the cells are immature, we have CD33. If the cells are mature and they are of T cell origin, they express CD3. If they are of B cell origin, they express CD20. All right, some markers of immunohistochemical staining. Here, what do we have here? Estrogen receptors in breast cancer tissue. What is the predictive value of this immunohistochemical staining if the breast cancer cells express hormone receptors and estrogen receptors in particular. What is the clinical significance of this pathological information? What do you think? It means that malignant cells need estrogen to proliferate. So what is the therapeutic implication of this finding? to block them, of course, to block the receptors. And this is what tamoxifen does. It blocks the stimulus for proliferation of malignant cells. I have only one minute because I have to finish at one o'clock. So, HER2, this is a bad prognostic marker 
That means that the survival potential is low of the patient. However, it is a predictive marker because I can use a drug to target these cells which overexpress HER2 protein and destroy them. So, you understand the difference between a prognostic marker which affects the survival of the patient and a predictive marker which affects the responsiveness of the tumor to a therapeutic agent. This herceptin blocks receptor ligand interactions and removes a major growth stimulus from malignant cells. And have a look at this metastasis here. What has it formed around? What is formed around the metastatic cells? What is formed? Because cancer causes angiogenesis. Excellent. It causes neovascularization. However, these newly formed vessels have two th are thin walled, thin walled, so they break easily and they may cause hemorrhage. This is why in thoracosynthesis, the fluid was serosanguineous. It contained blood because of these small vessels which had grown and they ruptured. And what has this tumor caused in the stroma so it becomes, it becomes too hard when you touch it? Many malignant cells alter their stroma and they cause desmoplasia. And when the fibroblasts leave, they leave collagen. And the stroma is collagenous. This is called sclerous cancer. And it most uh, frequently arises in breast cancer and pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. They alter the stroma and they make it acellular acellular and pink due to collagen deposition. So this is the altered stroma of cancer. End of lesson. Okay, thank you very much. Is there another lesson now? No, no finished? Okay.